The Sane Society by Eric Fromm. Uh, This is the third part of chapter 8. Political Transformation. I've tried to show in a previous chapter that democracy cannot work in an alienated society, and that the way our democracy is organized contributes to the general process of alienation. If democracy means that the individual expresses his conviction and asserts his will, the premise is that he has a conviction and that he has a will. The facts, however, are that the modern alienated individual has opinions and prejudices, but no convictions, likes and dislikes. Oh, sorry, no convictions, um, has likes and dislikes, but no will. His opinions and prejudices, likes and dislikes, are manipulated in the same way as his taste is by powerful propaganda machines, which might not be effective were he not already conditioned to such influences by advertising and by his whole alienated way of life. The average voter is poorly informed, too. While he reads his newspaper regularly, the whole world is so alienated from him that nothing makes real sense or carries real meaning. He reads of billions of dollars being spent, of millions of people being killed, figures, abstractions, which are in no way interpreted in a concrete, meaningful picture of the world. The science fiction he reads is a little different from the science news. Everything is unreal, unlimited, impersonal. Facts are so many lists of memories or sorry, facts are so many lists of memory items, like puzzles in a game, not elements on which his life and that of his children depends. It is indeed a sign of resilience and basic sanity of the average human being, that in spite of these conditions, political choices today are not entirely irrational, but that to some extent sober judgment finds expression in the process of voting. In addition to all this, one must not forget that the very idea of majority vote lends itself to the process of abstractification and alienation. Originally, majority rule was an alternative to minority rule, the rule by the king or feudal lords. It did not mean that the majority was right. It meant that it is better for the majority to be wrong than for a minority to impose its will on the majority. But in our age of conformity, the democratic method has more and more assumed the meaning that a majority decision is necessarily right and morally superior to that of the minority, and hence has the moral right to impose its will on the minority. Just as a nationally advertised product claims, 10 million Americans can't be wrong, so the majority decision is taken as an argument for its rightness. This is obviously an error. In fact, historically speaking, all right ideas in politics, as well as in philosophy, religion, or science, were originally the ideas of minorities. If one had decided the value of an idea on the basis of numbers, we would still be dwelling in caves. As Schumpeter has pointed out, the voter simply expresses preferences between two candidates competing for his vote. He is confronted with various political machines, the political bureaucracy which is torn between goodwill for the best for the country and the professional interest of keeping in office or getting back into it. This political bureaucracy needing votes is of course forced to pay attention to the will of the voter to some extent. Any signs of great dissatisfaction force the political parties to change their course in order to obtain votes and any sign of a very popular course of action will induce them to continue it. In this respect, even the non-democratic authoritarian regime is to some extent dependent on the popular will, except that by its coercive methods, it can afford for a much longer time to pursue an unpopular course. But aside from the restricting or furthering influence which the electorate has on the decisions of the political bureaucracy, and which is more an indirect than a direct influence, There is little the individual citizen can do to participate in the decision-making. Once he has cast his vote, he has abdicated his political will to his representative, who exercises it according to the mixture of responsibility and egotistical professional interest which is characteristic of him. 
and the individual citizen can do little except vote at the next election, which gives him a chance to continue his representative in office or to throw the rascals out. The voting process in the great democracies has more and more the character of a plebiscite in which the voter cannot do much more than register agreement or disagreement with powerful political machines, to one of which he surrenders his political will. The progress of the democratic process from the middle of the 19th to the middle of the 20th centuries is one of the enlargement of franchise, which has by now led to the general acceptance of unrestricted and universal suffrage. But even the fullest franchise is not enough. The further progress of the democratic system must take a new step. In the first place, it must be recognized that true decisions cannot be made in an atmosphere of mass voting, but only in the relatively small groups corresponding perhaps to the old town meeting, and comprising not more than, let us say, 500 people. In such small groups, the issues at stake can be discussed thoroughly, each member can express his ideas, can listen to and discuss reasonably other arguments. People have personal contact with each other, which makes it more difficult for demagogic and irrational influences to work on their minds. Secondly, the individual citizen must be in the possession of vital facts, which enables him to make a reasonable decision. Thirdly, whatever he, as a member of such a small and face-to-face -face group, decides must have a direct influence on the decision-making exercised by the citizen, oh, sorry, exercised by a centrally elected parliamentary executive. If this were not so, the citizen would remain as politically stupid as he is today. The question arises whether such a system of combining a centralized form of democracy as it exists today with a high degree of decentralization is possible whether we can reintroduce the principle of the town meeting into modern industrialized society. I do not see any insoluble difficulty in this. One possibility is to organize the whole population into small groups of, say, 500 people, according to local residents or place of work, and as far as possible, these groups should have a certain diversification in their social, social composition. These groups would meet regularly, let us say once a month, and choose their officials and committees, which would have to change every year. Their program would be the discussion of the main political issues, both of local and of national concern. According to the principle mentioned above, any such discussion, if it is to be reasonable, will require a certain amount of factual information. How can this be given? It seems perfectly feasible that a cultural agency which is politically independent can exercise the function of preparing and publishing factual data to be used as material in these discussions. This is only what we do in our school system, where our children are given information which is relatively objective and free from the influence of fluctuating governments. Oh, honey, no, that's not true. One could imagine arrangements, for instance, by which personalities from the fields of art, sciences, religion, business, politics, whose outstanding achievements and moral integrity are beyond doubt, could be chosen to form a non-political cultural agency. They would differ in their political views, but it can be assumed that they could agree reasonably on what is to be considered objective information about facts. In the case of disagreement, different sets of facts could be presented to the citizens, explaining the basis for the difference. After the small face-to-face -face groups have received information and have discussed matters, they will vote. With the help of the technical devices we have today, it would be very easy to register the overall result of these votes in a short time. And then the problem would be how decisions arrived at in this way could be channeled into the level of the central government and made effective in the field of decision-making. There is no reason why forms for this process could not be found. In the parliamentary tradition, we have usually two parliamentary houses, both participating in the decision-making, but elected according to different principles. The decision of the face-to-face -face groups would constitute the true House of Commons, which would share power with the House of Universally Elected Representatives and a Universally Elected Executive. In this way, decision-making would constantly flow, not only from above to below, but from below to above, and it would be based on an active and responsible thinking of the individual citizen. 
Through the discussion and voting in small face-to-face groups, a good deal of the irrational and abstract char- character of decision-making would disappear, and political problems would become, in reality, a concern for the citizen. The process of alienation in which the individual citizen surrenders his political will by the ritual of voting to powers beyond him would be reversed, and each individual would take back into himself his role as a participant in the life of the community. Cultural Transformation No social or political arrangement can do more than further or hinder the realization of certain values and ideals. The ideals of the Judeo-Christian tradition cannot possibly become realities in a materialistic civilization whose structure is centered around production, consumption, and success on the market. On the other hand, no socialist society could fulfill the goal of brotherliness, justice, and individualism unless its ideas are capable of filling the hearts of man with a new spirit. We do not need new ideas or new spiritual goals. The great teachers of the human race have postulated the norms for sane living. To be sure, they have spoken in different languages, have emphasized different aspects, and have had different views on certain subjects. But altogether, these differences were small. The fact that the great religions and ethical systems have so often fought against each other and emphasized their mutual differences rather than their basic similarities was due to the influence of those who built churches, hierarchies, political organizations upon the simple foundations of truth laid down by the men of the spirit. Since the human race made the decisive turn away from rootedness in nature and animal existence to find a new home in conscience and brotherly solidarity, since it conceived first the idea of the unity of the human race and its destiny to become fully born, the ideas and ideals have been the same. In every center of culture and largely without any mutual influence, the same insights were discovered, the same ideals were preached. We today, who have easy access to all these ideas, who are still the immediate heirs to the great humanistic teachings, we are not in need of new knowledge of how to live sanely, but in bitter need of taking seriously what we believe, what we preach and teach. The revolution of our hearts does not require new wisdom, but new seriousness and dedication. The task of impressing on people the guiding ideals and norms of our civilization is, first of all, that of education. But how woefully inadequate is our educational system for this task? Its aim is primarily to give the individual the knowledge he needs in order to function in an industrialized civilization, and to form his character into the mold which is needed ambitious and competitive, yet cooperative within certain limits, respectful of authority, yet desirably independent, as some report cards have it, have it. friendly, yet not deeply attached to anybody or anything. Our high schools and colleges continue with the task of providing their students with the knowledge they must have to fulfill their practical tasks in life, and with the character traits wanted on the personality market, Very little indeed do they succeed in imbuing them with the faculty of critical thought or with character traits which correspond to the professed ideals of our civilization. Surely there is, surely, surely there is no need to elaborate on this point and to repeat a criticism which has been made so competently by Robert Hutchins and others. There is only one point which I want to emphasize here, the necessity of doing away with the harmful separation between theoretical and practical knowledge. This very separation is part of the alienation of work and thought. It tends to separate theory from practice and to make it more difficult rather than easier for the individual to participate meaningfully in the work he is doing. If work is to become an activity based on his knowledge and on the understanding of what he is doing, then indeed there must be a drastic change in our method of education, in the sense that, from the very beginning, theoretical instruction and practical work are combined. For the young people, practical work should be secondary to theoretical instruction. Practical work should be secondary to theoretical instruction. For the people beyond school age, it should be the reverse. But at no age of development would the two spheres be separated from each other, 
No youngster should graduate from school unless he had learned some kind of handicraft in a satisfactory and meaningful manner. No primary education would be considered finished before the student has a grasp of the fundamental technical processes of our industry. Certainly, high school ought to combine practical work of handicraft and of modern industrial technique with theoretical instruction. The fact that we aim primarily at the usefulness of our citizens for the purposes of the social machine and not at their human development is apparent in the fact that we consider education necessary only up to age up to the age of 14, 18, or at most the early 20s. Why should society feel why should society feel responsible only for the education of children and not for the education of all adults of every age? Actually, as Alvin Johnson has pointed out so convincingly, the age between 6 and 18 is not by far as suitable for learning as is generally assumed. It is, of course, the best age to learn the three R's and languages, but undoubtedly the understanding of history, philosophy, religion, literature, psychology, etc. is limited at this early age, and in fact, even around 20, at which age uh, these subjects are taught in college, is not ideal. In many instances, to really understand the problems in these fields, a person must have had a great deal more experience in living than he has had at a college age. For many people, the age of 30 or 40 is much more appropriate for learning, and the sense of understanding rather than of memorizing, than school or college age, and in many instances the general interest is also greater at the later age than at the stormy period of youth. It is around this age also at which a person should be free to change his occupation completely, and hence to have a chance to study again, the same chance which today we permit only our youngsters. A sane society must provide possibilities for adult education, much as it provides today for the schooling of children. This principle finds expression today in the increasing number of adult education courses, but all these private arrangements encompass only a small segment of the population, and the principle needs to be applied to the population as a whole. Schooling, be it transmission of knowledge or formation of character, is only one part, and perhaps not the most important part of education. Using education here in its literal and most fundamental sense of edu, or educer, to bring out that which is within man. Even if man has knowledge, even if he performs his work well, if he is decent, honest, and has no worries with regard to his material needs, he is not and cannot be satisfied. Man, in order to feel at home in the world, must grasp it not only with, with his head, but with all his senses, his eyes, his ears, with, his, with all his body. He must act out with his body what he thinks out with his brain. Body and mind cannot be separated in this or in any other aspect. If man grasps the world and thus unites himself with it by thought, he creates philosophy, theology, myth, and science. If man expresses his grasp of the world by his senses, he creates art and ritual. He creates song, dance, drama, painting, sculpture. Using the word art, we are influenced by its usage in the modern sense, as a separate area of life. We have on the one hand the artist, specialized profession, and on the other hand the admirer and consumer of art. But this separation is a modern phenomenon. Not that there were not artists, in all great civilizations. The creation of the great Egyptian, Greek, or Italian sculptures were the work of extraordinarily gifted artists who specialized in their art. So were the creators of Greek drama or of music since the 17th century. But what about a Gothic cathedral, a Catholic ritual, an Indian rain dance, a Japanese flower arrangement, a folk dance, community singing? Are they art? Popular art? We have no word for it because art, in a wide and general sense, as a part of everybody's life, has lost its place in our world. What word can, be, can we use, then? In the discussion of alienation, I use the term ritual. The difficulty here is, of course, that it carries... The difficulty here is, of course, that it carries a religious meaning. 
which puts it again in a special and separate sphere. For lack of a better word, I shall use collective art, meaning the same as ritual. It means to respond to the world with our senses in a mean meaningful, skilled, productive, active, shared way. In this description, the shared is important and differentiates the concept of collective art from that of art in the modern sense. The latter is individualistic, both in its production and its consumption. Collective art is shared. It permits man to feel one with others in a meaningful, rich, productive way. It is not an individual leisure time occupation added to life. It is an integral part of life. It corresponds to a basic human need, and if this need is not fulfilled, man remains as insecure and anxious as if the need for a meaningful thought picture of the world were unrealized. In order to grow out of the receptive into the pr productive orientation, he must relate himself to the world artistically, and not only philosophically or scientifically. If a culture does not offer such a realization, the average person does not develop beyond his receptive or marketing orientation. Where are we? Religious rituals have little importance anymore, except for the Catholics. Secular rituals hardly exist. Aside from the attempts to imitate rituals in lodges, fraternities, etc., we have a few patriotic and sport rituals, appealing only to a most limited extent to the needs of the total personality. We are a culture of consumers. We drink in the movies, the crime reports, the liquor, the fun. There's no active, productive participation, no common unifying experience, no meaningful acting out of significant answers to life. What do we expect from our young generation? What are they to do when they have no opportunity for meaningful, shared, artistic activities? What else are they to do but to escape into drinking, movie daydreaming, crime, neurosis, and insanity? What help is it to have almost no illiteracy and the most widespread higher education which has existed at any time if we have no collective expression of our total personalities, no common art and ritual? Undoubtedly, a relatively primitive village in which there are still real feasts, common artistic shared expressions, and no literacy at all is more advanced culturally and more healthy mentally than our educated newspaper reading, radio listening culture. No sane society can be built upon the mixture of purely intellectual knowledge, an almost complete absence of shared artistic experience, college plus football, crime stories plus 4th of July celebrations, with Mother's and Father's Day and Christmas thrown in for good measure. In considering how we can build a sane society, we must recognize that the need for the creation of collective art and ritual on a non-clerical basis is at least as important as literacy in higher education. The transformation of an atomistic into a communitarian society depends on creating again the opportunity for people to sing together, walk together, dance together, admire together, and not to use Reisman's succinct expression as a member of a lonely crowd. A number of attempts have been made to revive collective art and ritual. The religion of reason with its new feast days and rituals was the form created by the French Revolution. National feelings created some new rituals, but they never gained the importance which the lost religious ritual once had. Socialism created its ritual in the 1st of May celebration, and the use of the fraternal comrade, etc., but the significance was never greater than that of the patriotic ritual. Perhaps the most original and profound expression of collective art and ritual was to be found in the German youth movement, which flourished in the years before and after the First World War. But this movement remained rather esoteric and was drowned in the rising flood of nationalism and racism. On the whole, our modern ritual is impoverished and does not fulfill man's need for collective art and ritual, even in the remotest sense, either as to quality or its quantitative significance in life. What are we to do? Can we invent rituals? Can one artificially create collective art? Of course not. But once one recognizes the need for them, once one begins to cultivate them, Seeds will grow and gifted people will come forth who will add new forms to old ones, and new talents will appear which, will, which would have gone unnoticed without such new orientation. 
Collective art will begin with the children's games in kindergarten, he continued in school, then in later life, or be continued in school, then in later life. We shall have common dances, choirs, plays, music, bands, not entirely replacing modern sport, but subordinating it to the role of one of the many non-profit and non-purpose activities. Here again, as in industrial and political organization, the decisive factor is decentralization, concrete face-to-face -face groups, active responsible participation. In the factory, in the school, in the small political discussion groups, in the village, various forms of common artistic activities can be created. They can be stimulated as much as is necessary by the help and suggestion from central artistic bodies, but not fed by them. At the same time, modern radio and television techniques give marvelous possibilities to bring the best of music and literature to large audiences. Needless to say, it cannot be left to business to provide for these opportunities, but that they must rank with our educational facilities, which do not make a profit for anybody. It might be argued that the idea of a large-scale revival of ritual and collective art is romantic, that it suits an age of handicrafts and not an age of machine production. If this objection were true, we might as well resign ourselves to the fact that our way of life would destroy itself soon because of its lack of balance and sanity. But actually, the objection is not any more compelling than the objections made to the possibility of railroads and heavier than air flying machines. There's only one valid point in this objection, the way we are, atomized, alienated, without any genuine sense of community, we shall not be able to create new forms of collective art and ritual. But this is just what I have been emphasizing all along. One cannot separate the change in our industrial and political organization from that of the structure of our educational and cultural life. No serious attempt for change and reconstruction will succeed if it is not undertaken in all those spheres simultaneously. Can one speak of a spiritual transformation of society without mentioning religion? Undoubtedly, the teachings of the great monotheistic religions stress the humanistic aims, which are the same as those which underlie the productive orientation. The aims of Christianity and Judaism are those of the dignity of man as an aim and an end in himself, of brotherly love, of reason, and of the supremacy of spiritual over material values. These ethical aims are related to certain concepts of God in which the believers of the various religions differ among themselves, and which are unacceptable to millions of others. However, it was an error of the non-believers to focus on attacking the idea of God. The real aim ought to be to challenge religion, religionists to take their religion, and especially the concept of God, seriously. That would mean to practice the spirit of brotherly love, truth, and justice, hence to become the most radical critics of present-day society. On the other hand, even from a strictly monotheistic standpoint, discussions about God mean to use God's name in vain. But while we cannot say what God is, we can state that what God is not. Is it not time to cease to argue about God and instead to unite in the unmasking of contemporary forms of idolatry? Today it is not Baal and Astarte, but the deification of the state and of power in authoritarian countries, and the deification of the machine and of success in our own culture. It is the all-pervading alienation which threatens the spiritual qualities of man. Whether we are religionists or not, whether we believe in the necessity for a new religion or in the continuation of the Judeo-Christian tradition, and as much as we are concerned with the essence and not with the shell, with the experience and not with the word, with man and not with the institution, we can unite in firm negation of idolatry and find perhaps more of a common faith in this negation than in any affirmative statements about God. Certainly we shall find more of humility and of brotherly love. This statement remains true even if one believes, as I do, that the theistic concepts are bound to disappear in the future development of humanity. In fact, for those who see in the monotheistic religions only one of the stations in the evolution of the human race, it is not too far-fetched to believe that a new religion will develop within the next few hundred years. A religion which corresponds to the development of the human race. The most important feature of such a religion would be its, un its 
universalistic character, corresponding to the unification of mankind which is taking place in this epoch. It would embrace the humanistic teachings common to all great religions of the East and of the West. Its doctrines would not contradict the rational insight of mankind today, and its emphasis would be on the practice of life rather than on doctrinal beliefs. Such a religion would create new rituals and artistic forms of expression, condu conductive to the spirit of reverence toward life and the solidar solidarity of man. Religion can, of course, not be invented. It will come into existence with the appearance of a new great teacher, just as they have appeared in previous centuries when the time was ripe. In the meantime, those who believe in God should express their faith by living it, those who do not believe by living the precepts of love and justice and waiting.